How to avoid the unthinkable when Europe's largest nuclear power plant finds itself on the front line of war. As UN inspectors prepare to visit Zaporizhia in the hopes of securing a facility hit by power outages and alleged attacks, we'll ask about accusations of Russian shelling from the compound, the risk of a Chernobyl-style meltdown, and the toll it's already taken on a complex that's now under Russian control but still operated by under-pressure Ukrainian staff. We'll ask about its strategic location as Kyiv mounts plans for a counter-offensive in the south and UN-led efforts to make Zaporizhia a demilitarized zone. More broadly, as Europe braces for a cold and expensive winter, as nuclear is touted as the carbon-free alternative to Russian natural gas, how does the fighting around Zaporizhia inform the decisions we take to ensure our energy security? Today in the France 24 debate, Zaporizhia in the middle, and joining us from Zaporizhia, Tatiana Drobotia, a volunteer with the charitable foundation, Palia Nitsia. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for, for calling me. She's a former political officer at NATO. Samantha de Bendern is an associate fellow at uh, the British think tank Chatham House. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Uh, former French senior, senior civil servant uh, uh, Nicolas Tenzer chairs the Center for Studies on Research and Political Decision. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. And from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Mariana Bujerin, Senior Research Associate at Harvard University's Project on Managing the Atom, your forthcoming book, Inheriting the Bomb, the Collapse of the USSR and the Nuclear Disarmament of Ukraine. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Uh, we uh, uh, want to ask you, uh, bef before we go into... Uh, uh, the uh, the bigger problem, Tatiana Drobotia, we, we see that the latest where you are is the handing out of these iodine pills. Have you have you seen that? Have you witnessed that or gotten yours? Uh, yes, uh, two weeks ago when only that news uh, appeared in the, our news feed, our volunteer center decided to uh, offer um, our volunteers and for their families, some iodide pills in order if we, if something bad happened, if uh, the mass sanitation leak uh, would be in our city, so we can just help ourselves. So now in our emergency uh, mass, mass and pills, we have iodide. Before, before this war, before the Russia came, I have never even thought about iodide in my in, in my flat. And how, how are people reacting to that? Uh, of course, we are scared. The fear of the mass predation leak um, is in the air. I would be honest with you. You know, sometimes uh, you are, you, you can be <laughs> very scared and then you start doing something and you don't think about it because, you know, we are uh, in the city that is a poor post. We are really close to the front line, so we cannot just... Um, sit and wait. We need to do something. I know that in our hospitals, uh, the family doctors uh, have iodide as well, and uh, people can go to the hospital and receive some, some pills there as well, too. Uh, so this is the situation. So iodide is number one them now. All right. The, as you mentioned, fears uh, 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 right near the plant. And with each day, we're seeing fresh claims and accusations of shelling around Zaporizhia. Uh, the complex, let's just remind our viewers, overtaken by the Russians at the very start of the war back in February. It finds itself on the Dnieper River on the front line. More from Charles Pellegrin. The thing is that... It's the uh, largest nuclear plant in Europe, and it's now in Russian hands. For weeks now, strikes have been landing in its surroundings. But who is shelling? Both sides are accusing each other of repeatedly firing at the plant. Kyiv continues its provocation to threaten us with a man-made nuclear disaster at Zaporizhia. The information war means a similar tune can be heard from Ukraine. But was the plant hit? It definitely was, but it isn't clear where exactly. Inside the security perimeter are six reactors and areas dedicated to used fuel and nuclear waste. The reactors are the most protected, 
to a point. The containment buildings, which are concrete domes, are there to protect the core of the reactor as well as the pool where a spent fuel is stocked, protect them from, for example, an aeroplane crash. But they haven't been designed for the risk of shelling in times of war. On the rest of the plant, some areas don't benefit from as much protection. That's because they're less dangerous. So is there a risk of contamination? A strike on a waste storage area would lead to a more limited and local spread, a few kilometers, maybe more, but not on a national or continental scale. For the time being, France's nuclear safety agency says no increase in radioactivity has been recorded in the area. So, uh, Mariana Bujerin, uh, how dangerous is it right now, Zaporizhia? Well, a, a nuclear power plant under the military occupation of an invading force uh, amid a war zone is a very dangerous situation. We, of course, don't know for sure what parts uh, of the uh, plant were hit uh, and where the damage is. And I think that's where the mission of the IAEA will be very important in assessing that. But overall, it, it, it's just difficult to assess all the different things that could happen amid the war, and where even a smaller accident without the capability and the ability to mitigate it, to, to really get there with fire crews, with repairs quickly in time, might uh, end up in a bigger, um, in, in to, might turn into a bigger incident. You mentioned the, the, the strikes that hit the complex. Do we know um, who did them? And um, do we have any firm confirmation of claims that uh, the Russians are stockpiling weapons there? We don't have a third party independent, uh, independently corroborated way of knowing who's shelling the plant. If I were a betting woman, if I had to place my bets, I know where I would uh, place them. I mean, this whole war has been uh, done under, has been prosecuted under um, this modus operandi of, of blaming the victim, right? Uh, with the inaugural speech of Mr. Putin blaming Ukraine for threatening Russia and, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, that's where I would personally weigh in. But I think perhaps... Um, you know, again, the, the IEA mission could make some assessments, although I have to say that, uh, you know, those are not the kinds of specialists that will be part of the mission, right? They're not going to be military ballistic specialists that could determine where the strikes come from. Right. There's two aspects then uh, to this mission. Those nuclear inspectors setting off uh, this Monday for Ukraine, the International Atomic Energy Agency, optimistic that both sides will allow uh, its team into the complex. The UN watchdog's chief spoke last Thursday to France 24. In Ukraine, it's already difficult. I've been there twice already. I was in Chernobyl, where we were also working and stabilizing the site. I, I, was, I was in South Ukraine, which is another uh, different nuclear power plant. Getting there is, of course, extremely complex. So we have to have all the security, security in the sense of uh, physical security, not being shot at, um, aspects that need to be taken care of. Samantha de Bender, your, your assessment of this IEA mission, how important it is and what it can accomplish. Well, it's very important indeed. I mean, first of all, we will have independent observers inside Zaporizhia who will be able to assess what's happening from the safety point of view. And even though they won't be specialists, they won't be ballistic specialists, they won't be military specialists, the fact that they are there will probably slow down any shelling that's taking place. And I'd just like to make a little sort of side point here. Everyone is talking about who is shelling whom. That's not really the issue here. The issue here is the Russians have taken hostage a nuclear power plant in a war zone. It's the second time they've done this in this conflict. That goes against international law to begin with. And secondly, it's allowing the whole world to fear the possibility of a radiation leak coming from Zaporizhia, whether it's a big leak or a small leak, again, is not the real debate we should be having. We should be talking about what Russia has done to try and terrorize not only Ukraine, but the whole of Europe here.
Of course, it doesn't have to be either or. No, no. I mean, it. The the a um, lot of talk has been has, since the beginning of this war. The nuclear threat has been basically the one threat that everyone has been worried about. What we have with Zaporizhia, we have a nuclear threat which could be attributed to either side if it happens. Russians have already been having, uh, sending out false flag warnings against potential chemical attacks in Ukraine that the Ukrainians would be preparing. If there is a chemical attack in Ukraine, the Russians will be able to say, oh, well, it's not actually us. With nuclear, with a nuclear weapon, there's no way Russia can hide behind anyone else detonating it. With an accident at Zaporizhia, it would allow them to use their nuclear card, but hide behind a potential deniability. But wouldn't that be suicidal for both sides? Not necessarily. As, as has been explained, the um, potential fallout for an accident at Zaporizhia, because of the way the reactor is built, would be far less catastrophic than Chernobyl. These are different types of reactors. They have much lighter cores. Chernobyl had a 200-ton core. Zaporizhia has a 30-ton core. The cooling system is different. So it would be catastrophic for the surrounding area. But we would be very, very unlikely to see the kind of cloud that's spread out across Europe as we do with the Chernobyl. Uh, of course, if if it is hit, well, whatever side does it, Nicolas Tenzel, they're, they're going to lose any kind of support from the local population. Yes, but, but I think there is absolutely no support for Russia, you know, in the surrounding areas at all. I mean, so the, the question is, I mean, basically, and I agree with what Samantha was saying just now, I think that the real problem is that the only one who could be guilty for any kind of accidents, even a small accident, is Russia. I mean, no, no one else. Of course, there could be, I mean, uh, catastrophic consequences for the, also for the Russians who are in the place. But, I mean, all the war has perfectly shown that Putin doesn't care about, you know, the Russian casualties. And you remember, I think it was one month or one half ago, you had the general, I mean, controlling all the areas, saying, well, okay, if we receive the order just to destroy the nuclear plant with all the catastrophes that, it will, that will occur, of course, because of that, then I will go. And I mean, you have, I mean, in this mentality, and I think the second thing is, that's basically, I mean, the fact that the, 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 the Russians control Zaporizhia since March the 4th, basically show that they want to use this as a kind of blackmail. That's a blackmail. And I think that's not, nothing, nothing else, I mean. What does it tell you, the fact that both the Russians and the Ukrainians are saying yes to the inspectors coming in? Well, I think for the moment, I mean, the Russians have said yes. But as you know, the team hasn't still arrived. I mean, we'll see, we'll see. I mean, let's time. be very cautious what the team will be able to do, what's the kind of documents and the people they will ac have access to. And I think that's the main question. And we still have questions. Still have questions. Uh, in the last minutes, Mariana Bujerin, the, the uh, uh, White House uh, commenting, its National Security Council spokesperson, uh, telling uh, reporters that uh, they back this plan to, to make the area around the plant a demilitarized zone, saying, quote, a controlled shutdown of the, plan, of the plant would be the safest option. Uh, but there's a lot of Ukrainians who depend on Zaporizhia uh, for their energy. That is true. And disconnecting such a large uh, electricity producing facility, even though it's not operating at its full capacity, it would still cause disruption to the Ukrainian grid and perhaps even the European grid uh, to which a Ukrainian grid is now connected since March. So it's not clear how safe, uh, I mean, you can do the shutdown safely on the in the nuclear uh, terms, in terms of nuclear safety, but it's unclear um, how safe uh, the Ukrainian critical infrastructure infrastructure would be at that point. Uh, Mariana Bujerin, uh, I just want to pick up on something that's been said here about uh, the, uh, uh, the popular opinion when it comes to all this. And I want to turn to Tatiana Drobotsia on this. Uh, Tatiana, um, uh, there's the fears that you expressed at the outset of the show uh, uh, with the distribution of those iodine tablets, with the fears of what could happen if the, if the plant is hit. We're also seeing reports of uh, people escaping the shelling, crossing front lines to get to where you are um, as, because they say their first fear is getting uh, hit by rockets, not by what's going to happen at Zaporizhia. On that score, what have you been seeing the last few days? You know, the thing is that uh, during the six months, we got used to shellings. So 
I hear them almost every day, and the shellings um, um, uh, went uh, more often, starting from the, our Independence Day, starting from the last week. But I know, even from my side, that uh, if we are thinking about uh, the plant line, so you can understand if it's go going closer to your city and you need to evacuate or it's, or it's steady as during the last months. But when we are talking about um, radiation leak, uh, this is the thing when time and every minute matters. So if we are talking about myself, I remember when uh, Russians uh, start shelling the, uh, power, the nuclear power station, I <laughs> woke up at night and I checked uh, news feed several times because I was afraid that I missed time. Uh, according to our government, they report daily that our radiation uh, is uh, normal, that everything is fine so far. But, you know, this um, kind of fear that you can be late, uh, it's uh, maybe the most uh, strong, uh, the most strong feeling that I faced uh, when the war started. Because wow. uh, the day when the Russians occupied Anargadar, it was the 4th of March, and a lot of people say that it was the most terrible day uh, during this war. And I remember a lot of people uh, were escaping the city because uh, Ukrainians faced Chernobyl 30 years, 35 years ago. And that's why we are really afraid that this can happen. And the thing is that we are dealing with the enemy who can do that for us. This is the problem. Yeah, it, it, it's so the fear is real. Uh, of course, Chernobyl bu built a long time ago. This this nuclear power plant, much uh, more recent. It's got six reactors that are themselves uh, 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 protected by reinforced uh, concrete. We can draw up a map uh, to show you. Um, uh, but as we saw in that report at the outset, uh, and I'll, I, I'll put it to you, Mariana Bujarin, the scope for danger goes well beyond those those six reactors, which are relatively well protected, say scientists. It is true. And uh, as Samantha has pointed out, uh, you know, there are newer reactors. They're different than Chernobyl, et cetera. But there are still very serious dangers. There are spent fuel pools. We haven't had, say, a fire in a spent fuel pool yet, thankfully, uh, at all in the world. Uh, but those could be really quite dangerous. And those could send, you know, radioactive plumes far and wide. Um, or, you know, to say that there's a dry cask storage uh, of spent fuel is hit that would uh, result in a contamination of immediate area, immediate area, which is the nuclear power plant, right? So people have to navigate through this contaminated area to safely run the rest of the reactors. Uh, again, the impossibility to mitigate properly, even a small incident, is what concerns me and what creates risk. On top of it is the human aspect, right? These Ukrainian workers have been running these very important uh, safety and security systems and protocols at a nuclear power plant under the barrel of the gun. Safety is as good as the humans that run it. So I really, really do hope that the IA mission, when it gets there, it can do something for those people, at least bear witness to the kinds of physical and psychological conditions in which they work. Yeah, because since February 24th and the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, there's a precedent. Uh, one can only imagine, as you say, the ordeal for the thousands of Ukrainians who staff Zaporizhia. Uh, back in the spring, after the Russians withdrew from Chernobyl in the north of the country, employees of that plant described the duress of having to work and sleep on the job under occupation. Let's take a listen uh, to one of those workers speaking of France 24's Catherine Norris Trent. They would catch you, knock you down, force you to lie on the ground with a machine gun in your back. They'd ask who you are, where you're going. They'd search your phone and your pockets. So you just had to look for a way out, a way to survive, and also try and find out what was happening to your family. There was no network, no connection, and you could see all their military equipment here, planes flying over, tanks flowing in an endless stream. Samantha Debender? 
Well, we've, we've had uh, reports coming out from workers in Zaporizhia as well. Uh, two workers were stopped last week, accused of giving information to the Ukrainian army. I mean, they're Ukrainian workers in a Ukrainian power station, so of course they're going to try and give information to the Ukrainian army. What we saw in Chernobyl as well was that there were the Russian soldiers were digging trenches in the radioactive dust. The so-called Red Forest. Exactly. And these soldiers then were taken to Belarus to, with, with severe radiation sickness. Th this is what the Russian army um, does to its soldiers. It doesn't care. So when you asked me earlier on whether it wouldn't be suicidal for, for the Russians to cause an accident at Zaporizhia, it wouldn't be suicidal for the people taking the decisions in Moscow. It would, of course, be, be um, a murder or, or at least a grave, bodily, grave endangerment of the soldiers who are in the plant, but that's not really a Russian concern. And, and also, uh, Tatiana and, and Mariana both mentioned the human aspect and the fear. The Russians know very well that embedded in the Ukrainian psyche is this fear, fear of radiation caused by Chernobyl. I, I was actually in Kiev when the Chernobyl accident happened, and I remember my, my Russian teacher said to me, I don't believe in this accident, and if I ever find out it really did happen, and you British students are being evacuated because you knew it before us, I'll lose all faith in the party the Communist Party. I saw him two years later and I said, so, Sergei, I, I was right, wasn't I? There really was an accident. He said, yes, there was an accident. You knew we were lied to. I've not only given my party card back, I've joined Uruch, the Ukrainian independence movement. This is how strong Chernobyl is in the Ukrainian psyche. The idea that we have been uh, lied to by Russia over radiation is something that the Ukrainians feel. And Russia knows that they are playing with Ukrainian psyche here. And the, they probably definitely understand the potential panic effect that an accident at Zaporizhia would cause, which could be much more deadly in the ensuing decision to flee the war zone than the actual radiation fallout. Tatiana Drobotsi, at the outset of this conversation, you told us yourself how 1986 and the nuclear accident uh, at Chernobyl uh, is still uh, high on the minds of uh, all citizens uh, where you are, how do you mitigate against the potential for panic, as just described by Samantha? Uh, yes, I agree with Samantha, and um, I also want to add that uh, that obvious lie about Chernobyl in 1886 uh, caused the, uh, that in 1991 Ukraine got their independence. We even uh, learned this in uh, our um, history lessons and um, um, in political technology, that this is really a strong uh, point in our history. So when I heard this for the first time, I, w I also was scared. But then I came to my volunteer organization, and we are focused on military support. And I asked the pe uh, people, what do they think and what shall we do? So we decided that we are staying in our places. And we continue to help militaries to struggle for our country. And we do as much possible as we can do here and now. But we should have I died uh, at home for our families. And we, have, we need to have uh, full tanked cars and uh, emergency suitcase uh, with us. But so, you know, uh, the, the thing is when you are living in a four coast city that is close to the front line, because it's only 30, from 30 to 50 miles to the front line from us for the six months already. So you are always ready to go. Uh, so in this situation, maybe we have the same structure. And moreover, our government now has for us the special sig signal of the siren of the air alarm. Uh, so in this case, we would know that some bad, something bad happened, but I hope that no. And uh, we are just uh, continuing to do what we, are, what we are doing, but even if we are scared. Mikura Tenzel, of course, the, the other difference is that in 1986, the Soviet Union was not at war. No, absolutely. But I think that you still have, I mean, this trauma, I mean, in the Ukrainian memory. And I think we have to also to read, I mean, the books uh, by the Belarusian uh, Nobel Prize winner, Alek uh, Alekseyevich, I mean, Svetlana Alekseyevich, wrote, I mean, uh, superbly about, you know, I mean, what, I mean, the Ukrainians at the time felt and how they, there was something, you know, that was really traumatic for them. And I mean, also they try also to surmount that. But no, we have something completely different. We have two things. First of all, we have, I mean, this risk. 
But this risk is, I mean, something which is part of the, I mean, atrocious war that uh, Putin has waged against the Ukrainian people. And I think that's the context of the war. The context of the war is that you had probably more than 100,000 Ukrainians who died because of the attack by the Russians. And you have this kind of, you had genocide, you have crimes against humanity, you had cr war crimes, and this could be a new kind of crimes. But I mean, for the Ukrainian people, there is something in a way ambiguous. Because I mean, the, 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 the public opinion, the world public opinions pay more attention to this specific event because everyone is concerned. And probably it's something quite different because, I mean, it could have geopolitical importance. But everything must have geopolitical importance. The second thing is, as it was said, you had, I mean, those Ukrainian guys taking into a hostage, I mean, by the Russian troops. And I the think staff I, the, the staff, I mean, the Ukrainian staff. And I think that for them, there is, of course, all the pressures. They could disappear, they could be shut down. I mean, by, 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 by the Russian, it could be shot by the Russian, I mean, at any time, that we have to know. But also, there is probably a consciousness for them that they could commit a kind of failure because of the pressure. And but I think that's a kind of responsibility. And I mean, everything relies on them. Do we have a reliable estimate, Mariana Bujarin, of uh, how much of the staff is still on duty? Well, it seems that most of the core staff had stayed. Um, again, we don't we don't have a very good quality information from inside the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, but it is actually one of those amazing things that most of the staff stayed. That some of them had managed to send their families away out of Enerhodar, which is the satellite city, uh, but they take it. They're taking this responsibility really, really seriously. And the, the few reports that we did get uh, where the, uh, the, the workers of the plant were able to talk to journalists on conditions of anonymity, what they were essentially saying is, as long as we stay here and as long as we're allowed to continue doing our jobs, this plant should be fine. This plant should be safe, barring, you know, some kind of major attack. Uh, but it is exactly this, this human aspect that if they're not uh, allowed to carry out their jobs, if they're intimidated, we have um, also read some reports of torture and intimidation. Again, it's, it's hard to corroborate, but uh, it's not unthinkable that the Russian military is putting all sorts of pressure on, those, on these people not to disclose things to the IAEA inspectors and so forth. So I think we have to be really, really mindful of this human aspect of what's going on uh, at the Zaporizhia, not just the technical damage that could uh, occur. Yeah, and just as Chernobyl left its mark on all of Europe, Zaporizhia, uh, is certainly on the minds uh, of the whole continent. Earlier, the French president uh, here in Paris speaking the company of the visiting Polish prime minister. Let's listen to Emmanuel Macron. Nuclear safety and security cannot be weakened by this war. That's why this mission is important. It must preserve the station and the safety and security of the whole region. Then, the sovereignty of Ukraine on this station cannot be contested. Nuclear energy cannot be a target of war, and it's important to defend Ukraine's sovereignty on the station. Ukraine's sovereignty, Nicolas Tenzer, um, uh, unambiguous, Emmanuel Macron there. I, I mean, it's absolutely not ambiguous. I mean, the question of the sovereignty of Ukraine on Zaporizhia, as well as on the Bas and Crimea, I mean, that's some things that Has is his wording gotten stronger? in the last couple of weeks when it comes to Ukraine? I, I think, yes, I think that Macron is going stronger day by day after day, certainly. I mean, there, he made a kind of U-turn. I mean, if we consider I mean, his previous stance, I mean, before the war started or at the beginning of the war, we remember all the humiliation thing and this kind of thing. No, I mean, probably he better understands that we cannot trust Mr. Putin on anything. Still trying to discuss. That's why, you know, he discussed. I mean, he hadn't since long discussed with him, but he decided to discuss on the fate of the Paricha because it was absolutely needed. But certainly, there is no trust between the two people. And um, certainly, no, he understands better than ever that Ukraine must win the war completely, totally, and that Russia must be defeated. There would be absolutely no peace as long as 
Russia controls. Completely part of meaning the taking territory. back all the Donbas, taking back Crimea. I, I think yes, because I mean, what he when when he decided, when he visited Kiev and he was in Kiev, he, he stated that I mean the question of the full sovereignty of Ukraine is not negotiable, and full sovereignty of Ukraine, integri in, uh, territorial integrity means Donbas and Crimea. I mean, that must be clear. And uh, no, we have many, many other questions, of course. Will the Allied dis will decide and accompany the Ukrainian troops to reconquer the old Donbass and Crimea? That's another question. Samantha de Bender, and of course, the sun is shining here in Paris. 28 degrees today, beautiful summer day. Uh, winter is coming. We heard the prime minister today talk about the possibility of rationing. There's an election in Italy where more pro-Russia uh, forces could come to power. Uh, is that resolve going to weaken? Yes, winter is definitely coming. And to, uh, to, to bounce back on what Nicola was saying when he said that um, Putin has basically drawn the attention of the whole world to the war in Ukraine through Zaporizhia, Putin has drawn the attention of the whole world to the war in Ukraine over his um, blackmail on agricultural products, especially wheat, and on energy. And this, of course, is what we're talking about now with the, the high energy prices that we're facing in Europe. So the question is this. What needs to be done for energy prices to go down? Will it be sufficient for the fighting to suddenly stop in Ukraine? Well, that, of course, will depend on who wins. For the fighting to suddenly stop in Ukraine, there are only two ways it'll stop now. Either Russia will just lay down arms or Ukraine will lay down arms. Both seem very unlikely. But let's try and imagine the fantasy future when the war stops. Does that mean that Europe is going to suddenly start buying gas again from Russia? That the prices are going to suddenly miraculously go down? That we will become friends again with Putin? Personally, looking at the, the, the statements of European leaders, of Emmanuel Macron and of other leaders, I don't see this happening. So I think that the, that the public needs to understand that the high energy prices and the cold winter that we're facing will not disappear if somehow Europe stops supporting Ukraine. This will stop when Russia stops blackmailing the world with food, with energy, and with a nuclear disaster. Of course, there's a lot of leveraging going around on all sides. Uh, we, again, uh, the French president making those remarks in the company of the Polish prime minister, uh, who borrowed the German expression for East-looking policy, Ostpolitik, uh, to settle scores, as both Macron and Mateusz Morawiecki talked up the need for European energy sovereignty. I saw another facet. It's the facet of cooperation with our neighbors, including our German neighbors, who've fed a certain vision of energy Ostpolitik, which has fallen into ruin. Instead of an Ostpolitik, we have a lost politic, an energy policy that's lost. Lost politics. Why is he taking a shot at Germany all of a sudden, Nicola Tenza? Well, because basically I think Germany is the weak link in Europe. Still. Still? I mean, even still, today? I mean, st even still today, I mean, up to a certain point, I mean, you don't have a lot of delivery of weapons, I mean, to, to Ukraine. You don't have, I mean, you but have It's a some radical shift we've seen from Berlin. The, and, and the, the, just for instance, yes, yes, there is a shift, but half shift, I would say. We are still in the middle of the way, in my view, in Germany. For instance, just say, you know, the main party, the SPD, didn't decide to expel from the the party, uh, Gerhard Schröder, the former chancellor, the former, former chancellor, who is basically, I mean, uh, put the head of assets. Gazprom. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, and they still envision, I mean, basically after the war to continue to have some trade with with Russia. They do not understand the very nature of Putin regime, and they didn't consider that if we want to have peace in Europe, Putin must Putin must be radically defeated. The regime must be defeated. If the regime survives the war, there will be no security in Europe. Just impossible. Uh, Samantha de Bender, uh, is that how you read those statements by the Polish prime minister? Yes. Uh, when we look at Germany, I mean, Germany increased its dependency on Russian gas systematically year by year after to the 2008-2009 winter when Russia showed that it could potentially use gas as a, as a blackmail, uh, as a weapon for blackmail against You even Europe. have the, the, the um, uh, green 
uh, Minister of Economy stating, okay, we're going to keep some of the nuclear power plants open. We're going to keep some of them open. That's what they're saying, yes. But there are also some other nuclear power plants that could be put back into, um, that could be put back on. It takes a long time to switch back on a nuclear power plant. I think the thing is German industry is also dependent on Russian gas. But there's another weak link here. And that is European energy procurement policies. Each European member state buys its gas independently. When Europe buys its gas from Gazprom, there's only one entity which knows at what price each country buys its gas. That is Gazprom. That is giving Gazprom an enormous amount of leverage over the whole of Europe. And until the European Union has a unified energy purchasing policy, the way we did for vaccines, we're going to have to let our weakest link let us down. And, and this is where there is a magnificent opportunity for the EU to really get together, have a unified energy policy, share up surplus energy, be it gas, be it nuclear, be it whatever. And the, the Commission is trying to push our member states towards that. There's a bit of resistance, but there is, I think, room for hope here. And it would be hope not just for European solidarity, but also for really trying to get the green energy up and running properly. Mariana Bujerin, uh, is there kind of a disconnect between the conversation we had uh, uh, for most of this show uh, on how dangerous the situation is right now around Zaporizhia and the discussion a lot are having in Europe now about how nuclear power is so great? Well, uh, I think the discussion is not just how nuclear power is so great, but that nuclear power just might be necessary as a, as a way to mitigate climate change and as a way to substitute for some of the other of the, the loss of hydrocarbons that are especially those imported from uh, from Russia. And, uh, you know, there, there are different uh, views on this uh, point, right? Some say that if you just manage nuclear power plants properly and institute all the right safety precautions, then it's it's a good, you know, and sustainable source of energy. But I think uh, you're certainly right that uh, Russian actions have put a, a big question mark about the future of nuclear uh, energy globally, not to mention that Russia is also a prominent supplier of nuclear reactors globally. And a lot of these uh, prospective contracts might be in the global south. So I would be interested to know what what those prospective clients of Russia's might be thinking about Russia's safety credentials, you know, when it comes to nuclear energy. When it comes to nuclear energy, is that the conversation they're having where you are in the United States right now, where there's been so much uh, in the headlines about the soaring price of gasoline? You know, it is strange that... Um, as far as I'm aware, U.S. official sources have kept rather quiet about kind of the prospects for, for nuclear energy, because, of course, there is much hope to, um, you know, to to be able to develop and sell these these new small modular reactors uh, that are being there is an, a variety that are being uh, developed around here. And there is, you know, big hopes uh, for deployment uh, of them globally. But I think uh, certainly those who are prospective buyers of these, both the small modular reactors and the traditional bigger ones, they have a lot of thinking to do, you know, to ensure that either the global governance of nuclear energy is up to a par uh, to be able to prevent such Zaporizhia scenarios, or they can somehow nationally secure their own nuclear power supply. Samantha Nabender, you heard uh, Mariana Bujerin uh, speak cautiously. Uh, over uh, what's happening inside of Zaporizhia. We don't have third-party confirmation on a lot of things. This sort of fog of war, uh, we're also seeing it in the South, where for days now, uh, Kiev has been touting the fact that it's going on a counteroffensive. There were more such claims uh, this Monday, uh, claims countered uh, by uh, Moscow, which has uh, said they, they failed. Uh, when it comes to the South of Ukraine, do you see a major counteroffensive coming and do you see it being successful? Yes, I mean, I've been scanning the, the Ukrainian news wires all day and there definitely is a, a counteroffensive that, 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 that started at 7 o'clock this morning. The, uh, the Ukrainians claim that they have uh, gone through the first line of defence that, that's surrounding the whole Kherson area. There are three lines of defence where the Russians have been entrenched um, with, with, with their heavy weaponry. They, they've been building sort of... Um, uh, uh, wooden, wooden and concrete defense um, barriers. The first one has been 
according to the Ukrainian sources, has been penetrated already. There is um, the Russian-led uh, Donetsk um, People's Republic 109th Brigade that is apparently on the route, running away from uh, from their positions in Kherson. So it, it would seem that this counteroffensive is definitely on the way. And, and the Ukrainians have a very narrow window of maneuver now. If they're going to try and reconquer some land, particularly Kherson, they're going to have to do it before the autumn rains make things a lot more difficult. And why is Kherson important? The Russians have said they're going to hold a referendum there on the 11th of September, a referendum on making Kherson be incorporated into the Russian Federation. Obviously, if the whole area is, is a battlefield, it will be impossible to hold this referendum. So this is also why this is such an important counteroffensive for the Ukrainians. Uh, Tatiana Drobotia, of course, uh, people don't realize it when we look at that map, uh, just how vast U Ukraine is. Uh, uh, you're hundreds of kilometers away f where you are from Kherson. Uh, are you feeling, though, any sign uh, of a counteroffensive? And what do people feel about it? I seem to have lost the connection there uh, with... Uh, with Tatiana Drobosi, we'll try to reconnect. Uh, Let's hear with that news tomorrow morning. Uh, Go ahead, Tatiana, we can hear you now. Honestly, when I read uh, those news uh, today's morning, I wanted to open open champagne, champagne bottle, and I know a lot of my friends, uh, you know, had some festive mood because of that, because really miss. Uh, um, that time when we go and reconquer our territories. So, of course, uh, Ukraine is really big and Kherson is like 200 miles uh, from Zaporizhia, but still, you know, it feels like uh, the common land and, and we understand that our government would, stop, uh, would start with Kherson and uh, the Kherson region and then uh, uh, it would be good. This is actually the strategic, uh, the strategic line. So uh, everything that we can do is support our soldiers, and uh, that, that's what we are doing. And as well, we we are um, we want them to be safe because today in Ukraine it's a memory day of all the defenders who gave their lives in order our country to be independent. And just before we go, Tatiana, very briefly, because we're almost out of time, what is your foundation doing where you are in Zaporizhia on that front? It's not personally my foundation. I'm a volunteer here of the biggest volunteer association in uh, Zaporizhia. We, ha we have uh, the tea in different uh, departments, what we are doing. So we help people who... who um, faced uh, Russian aggression. So, uh, like today, I was in the place where the Russian missile sh shelled, and before it was two houses, and now there is nothing, and we are building a new house for them. Uh, we uh, also collect um, uh, food, medicine, hygiene from um, our partners in Europe, in the United States, uh, in, in, different, in different parts of, of the world. And uh, as well, well, we give them to the soldiers and people uh, and deliver to the people on the occupied territories because now uh, uh, there is problem with the uh, children's hygiene, with the children's food, with the just uh, regular medicines that uh, we got used to in our regular life, you know. So the life on the occupation territory is really tough. And we try to help those people who, who cannot leave uh, the territories on the personal reasons. And of course, uh, uh, support to our soldier, soldiers, such as uh, drones. We teach them, we support them, we produce um, um, body armor, and we buy cars and um, adapt them for the military purposes. So this is our key. And I'm a volunteer there. I'm a media manager. And Tatiana Drobotia, we, uh, of course, our thoughts are with you and the people uh, in uh, Zaporizhia. Thank you so much for being with us here in the France 24 debate. We want to thank uh, as well Mariana Bujerin in uh, Washington, Samantha de Benzer and uh, Nicolas Tenzer. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.